Stay with it there, Dave. Hey, uh, <laughs> looks a bit like the 4th of July, doesn't it? Well, these are the colors and effects produced by electric arc welding. It takes some special equipment to do this job correctly and some special gear to do it safely. We'll be talking about the types of tools and equipment used by welders and the safety precautions that welders and their assistants take before they begin their work. We're also going to look at the different methods of arc welding used in the plant. All done, Carol. Okay, Dave, thanks. You see, arc welding is done every day in plants like yours to repair all kinds of equipment and connecting systems. It is the process of applying sufficient heat to two separate metal surfaces to make them melt and fuse as one solid piece. Electricity provides the heat source, and electric arc welding is referred to as fusion welding. Well, as a welder's assistant, you'll be making most of the necessary preparations for a welding job. You'll be gathering the tools and the proper safety equipment, and you'll also be setting up all of the welding equipment. Well, to do these things, you'll need to be completely familiar with the various tools and types of equipment used in welding, but you'll also get some valuable on-the-job training. As you work with a qualified welder, you'll be able to see how the jobs are done. You'll see that from a safety point of view, it's necessary for an assistant to work closely with a welder and be familiar with the process. We'll be discussing several types of arc welding. The type that you'll use will depend on the kind of welding to be done. As you become familiar with the welding process, you'll see that there are specific requirements for each kind of weld. Well, first, we need to know how the welding process works. So, let's take a look at some of the equipment that is used in welding. Now, the source of the heat required for welding is the electric current provided by the welding machine. Welding machines operate on alternating current. The machine then supplies the welder alternating or direct current, AC or DC current. The electric current flows from the welding machine through cables that are designed to have minimum resistance to the constant flow of current. Now, this is very important because any change in the rate of flow of current will affect the welding process. Try to keep the length of cable between the welding machine and the work area as short as possible since the shorter the cable, the lower the current loss. And of course, only welding cable can be used. Never substitute any other kind of cable when uh, setting up the welding equipment. Now the cables are attached to the welding machine with special connectors or bolts to prevent them from pulling loose. The special connectors should be used when two lengths of cable must be connected. The electrode holder is the welding tool, and it's often called the stinger. It is connected to one of the cables from the welding machine. Electrode holders are made in many sizes and shapes. Each is designed for a specific range of uses determined by the diameter of the electrode and the amperage or current flow ratings. Now, basically, there are low range electrodes for low amperage applications and high range electrodes for high amperage applications. The amperage or current rating of an electrode should not be exceeded. If it is, the holder may overheat, causing personal injury or equipment damage. The holder itself is designed for quick and easy electrode replacement. There are two types that we'll look at, the twist lock and the insulated spring jaw. These are the types you'll be most likely to see. The twist lock type, as the name implies, twists to lock the electrode into place once it has been inserted into the holder. The spring jaw holder works like a clamp. When the handle is squeezed, the jaw is open and the electrode is inserted. Then the handle is released. The electrode then is clamped into place. Both holders are insulated and designed to keep the electrode securely in place, which prevents any movement as the tool is being used. Now, how do we hook them up? Well, one of the cables 
connects the welding machine to the electrode holder, providing a path for current flow between the electrode and welding machine. Now, the second cable, also connected to the welding machine, is clamped to the work. If the work is set on a metal table or work area, the second clamp may be connected to the table. Now, this cable is referred to as the ground and completes the path for current flow that is required for arc welding. Let's trace the current flow. The current starts at the welding machine through the first cable and to the electrode. From there, it is transmitted to the work and then back down the second cable, which returns it to the welding machine. If you're using a DC welding machine, the way the cables are connected determines the polarity, that is, whether the charge at the lead is positive or negative. A positive charge at the lead results in more heat generation through the electrode. A negative charge at the lead means that heat generation is more intense on the work surface. The work area, of course, must be grounded. For a fixed welding machine, this is usually done by grounding the welding machine to the building. In this way, the welding process can be safely accomplished. Now, for a portable machine, the leads are connected to the work. Now, as the current is carried from the welding machine and the cable through the electrode, it will flow or arc to the work. The electrode does not actually touch the surface during welding. There is an electrical difference between the electrode and the work. As the electrode nears the work, the current will start to flow. The current causes some of the rod to melt, creating an arc. Now the welder must maintain the proper distance to keep the arc going without touching the work. As the current arcs to the work surface, sufficient heat is created to melt both the base metal of the work surface and the electrode itself. Thus, the weld is formed by the rod and base metal flowing together. During this process, the rod is consumed and the metal of the rod is deposited in the weld. The consumable rod is only one type used in welding. We'll look at the other non-consumable rods later. First, though, let's look at a few of the things that you should be careful about when you're setting up the welding equipment. Inspect the cables and connections closely. If you find any worn cables or frayed connections, repair or replace them before you start setting things up. If you don't, you or the welder might receive a shock when the electric current is turned on. Now check the electrode holder here to see that it is in safe working condition. The insulation on the handle should not be nicked or cracked so that the metal is showing through. Test the holder to make sure that the rod is held securely. In addition, make sure that all of the proper safety equipment is at hand. This will include a welding helmet and gloves for the welder and assistant, a face mask and protective outer clothing for the welder, and any other protective equipment required in your plant's regulations. Finally, before the current is turned on, check the welding machine to make sure that it is properly grounded. Well, we've been talking about some of the jobs you'll do as a welder's assistant. You can see that it's important for you to be familiar with the tools and equipment used for welding and that adequate safety precautions must be taken. We've seen how the electrical current is transmitted from the welding machine through the cable to the electrode and then back again. So before we go on to talk about a specific type of welding, go over this material in your text and ask your instructor to explain anything that isn't clear to you. We've had a look at some of the equipment used in welding and uh, We've seen how electrical power is used in the process. Now we're going to talk about one of the most common and one of the oldest methods of welding, shielded metal arc welding. Shielded metal arc welding is usually called stick welding. The equipment used is the welding machine or power source, the two welding cables, an electrode and the electrode holder, 
and the ground or work connection clamp. Now, there are two types of electrode holders that can be used, the twist lock holder and the insulated spring jaw holder. Both types hold the electrode firmly in place as the welder welds. Electrodes, or rods as they're often called, are available in several varieties, each with a specific application. However, they're all made of wire and they all have an outside coating. When current from the welding machine is applied to the electrode, the outside coating on the electrode melts. And during the melting, gas is released, forming a shield around the molten metal as the weld is formed. The shield allows the molten metal to form a strong welded bond because it keeps air from coming in contact with the molten metal. If the shield were not present, the oxygen and nitrogen in the air would combine with the molten metal to cause the weld bond to be weak and brittle. The weld is formed by molten metal from the work surfaces and from the electrode itself. The electrode is burned or consumed in the welding process and the metal deposited in the weld. So for this reason, it is essential to choose the correct electrode for each welding job. The metal of the electrode must be compatible with the metal of the work or they'll not blend together to form a strong weld bond. Now we'll talk about the types of electrodes and their selection a little later. As the metal and electrode are melted together, a weld is formed. This weld is usually called a bead. As welding takes place, the bead is formed from the puddle of molten metal. When the metal cools, a rough area is formed on the bead, and this rough area is called slag. Slag comes from the coating on the outside of the electrode. As the coating melts and cools, it forms a protective covering over the weld bead. It also causes the weld to cool slowly, which relieves some of the stresses formed in the metal during welding. The slag deposit also provides additional protection during cooling, preventing oxygen and nitrogen in the surrounding air from coming in contact with the weld. Now, once the metal has cooled, the slag must be removed. This is usually done by chipping it off with a chipping hammer. However, if the slag deposits are light, a wire brush may be all that's needed to remove it. It's very important that all slag deposits are removed. Now I said that slag is formed from the melted coating on the electrode. So if another weld were put over the slag, there would not be a proper bond because the slag is not a metal material. It would not melt and fuse with the other metals. Being non-metallic and porous, it would leave a weak spot between the two beads that could cause the weld to break. In the process of shielded metal or stick welding, the first step is to ensure that the metal surfaces to be welded are clean. This is usually done by grinding. An air-powered hand grinder can be used to smooth the surfaces of the metal to be welded. There are also stationary grinding machines that are used for work that can be moved from its place and is easily handled by one person. When the surfaces of the metal to be welded are clean, the pieces may be tack welded. A tack weld is a small weld that is made to hold the work in place for welding. Slag that is formed on the tack weld is removed before the welder begins the job of welding. Well, let's watch now as a welder demonstrates the process of stick welding. As I said, the first step is to clean the surface to be welded. The welder will grind the rim of the pipe with an air-powered grinder. As the metal is cleaned, sparks and chips will be thrown off, so it's very important to take adequate safety precautions. Goggles and a face shield should always be worn. Leather gloves give good protection and allow for a firm grip while guiding the grinder. Holding the grinder at a 35 to 40 degree angle, the outer edge of the pipe rim is ground all around using a back and forth motion to help ensure that all areas are covered. It's best to turn the pipe from time to time so that the same angle of the grinder can be applied to all sides of the pipe. Also, it's a good idea to turn off the power when turning the pipe around. 
just in case the grinder slips. Next, the top part of the pipe rim is ground, holding the grinder straight down and using the same backward and forward motion. The back and forth motion also prevents hot spots from forming on the metal or grinding wheel. Now it's essential that all rust or oxidation be removed before welding. If they are not, the result can be an incomplete and weak weld bond. The next step is to tack weld the two surfaces to be welded. For our demonstration, the welder will use two test coupons. These are pieces of pipe welded together by a welder to demonstrate adequate skill in performing a satisfactory weld. This is typically referred to as a certification weld. A tack spacer, which is just a thin bent wire, is placed between the two pieces of pipe. This provides an even space for the weld to spread through the wall thickness of the pipe. The work is done on a welding table, which is a specially designed table with holes for pegs that keep objects to be welded firmly in place. The welder first puts on his goggles, then his helmet, making sure it's snug, and finally his gloves. Then he lines up the pipes with the tack spacer in between them. Now the electrode is put into the holder. The helmet is brought down to protect the face and the first tack weld is made. And when the first tack weld is finished, the pipe is turned a third of the way around to where the second tack weld will be made. The spacer is adjusted to keep it out of the way of the weld. Then the pipe is turned again one third of the way around and the spacer adjusted once more. Now the third and final tack weld is made. The spacer is then removed. The last step before welding this test coupons is to remove the slag from around the tack welds so there's a clean surface for welding. The pipes are held in place on the table with two pegs. Then, wearing a face shield and gloves, the welder grinds each of the tack welds to rid the surface of any slag. The pipe is turned so the welder can get at each of the tack welds to clean them for welding. Now the welder is ready to weld the two pieces of pipe together. The pipe is placed on a welding stand, then the grounding cable is clamped onto the welding stand. As always, when performing a welding job, the helmet and gloves are worn. An electrode is locked into the holder, and we're ready to begin. Then with the helmet pulled down to protect his face, the welder tack welds the pipe to the stand. This holds the pipe in place during welding. When the job is done, the tack weld will be removed. The welding tool is held very firmly remains steady during the welding process. The welding stand simulates the position of the pipe in a system and allows the welder to make the weld 
all around the pipe evenly and fully through the wall thickness of the pipe. Because the electrode is being consumed during the welding, the rod must be replaced from time to time. Since the pipe wall is thicker than a single weld bead, several passes will have to be made. Each time a bead is laid down, it is called a pass. Remember, the slag must be cleaned off between each pass. You'll recall that the test coupons were prepared for welding by using a portable grinder. Now we're gonna look at two other ways of uh, grinding metal in preparation for welding. The principle is the same as the hand grinder we saw earlier. While the grinder is fixed, the wheels may look different, they perform the same purpose. However, fixed grinders are limited to grinding smaller parts and pieces, whereas a, a portable grinder can be used on movable equipment. This is a belt grinder. The belt is made of heavy cloth or paper, similar to uh, heavy sandpaper that can be removed from the roller. Belts of varying grit can be used on this grinder. The metal to be ground is pressed against the belt until the surface is cleaned. Another method of fixed grinding uses a stone grinding wheel and is effective when hard metal surfaces must be cleaned or smoothed. The metal edge is rubbed against the wheel stone using a back and forth motion. Now, this method is not suitable for soft metals since the soft metal will fill the pores of the wheel, reducing or stopping its grinding action. If it is necessary to cut or remove more metal, one method is with a carbon air arc torch. In our demonstration, the welder is going to use this technique to cut a groove in a piece of metal. The process is often called arc gouging. Since the welder is not working in a designated welding area, an additional person should act as a fire watch. Those sparks and bits of metal that are thrown off in this process are very hot and it's possible that something in the area could be ignited. This precaution is especially important where the welder cannot fully see the effects of the cutting or welding. A good example would be the other side of a metal wall or tank. The fire watch is a must for plant safety. Well, we've seen how two pieces of pipe are welded together. Now, we'll watch as the welder welds two small pieces of plate metal on the welding table. First step is to tack weld the metal plates. This is done as before with a spacer between the metal plates. After the spacer is removed and the tack welds cleaned off with the grinder, the metal plates are placed on several pieces of metal to elevate them above the table. This enables the welder to make the weld completely through the thickness of the metal plate and keeps the plates from being welded to the table. Well, we've seen how two pieces of metal are welded together using the shielded metal or stick welding process. We've observed the steps of grinding, gouging, tack welding, and welding. We've seen how the electrode is consumed in the process. In addition, we talked about how a protective shield is formed by the coating of the electrode and why slag deposits must be removed. Finally, we saw how the welder is protected by using the necessary safety equipment during the welding process. We're going to talk about two other methods of arc welding after you look over your text. If there's something you don't understand about stick welding and uh, the process that we've talked about, be sure to discuss it with your instructor. This is the shielded metal method of arc welding that we talked about earlier. We saw that the electrode was consumed during the welding process and that the coating on it forms a protective shield against contamination by the surrounding air. Well, now we're going to take a look at two other methods of arc welding that are also commonly used in plants like yours. They are the metal inert gas method, MIG, and the tungsten inert gas method called TIG. Now like the shielded metal or stick method of welding, MIG and TIG are 
fusion welding processes. The base metal is melted to fuse the work pieces together and form a bond. But there are differences, and we'll have a look at these two welding processes to see what those differences are. Let's start first with MIG welding. First of all, the equipment used for MIG welding is quite similar to that used for stick welding. The welding machine can be the same since both processes use direct or alternating current. But instead of a coated electrode, the gas shield in the MIG process is provided by inert gas that is supplied from one or more pressurized cylinders. The electrode holder used in the MIG method is quite different from the type used for the stick welding. It is commonly called a gun because it is trigger operated. The trigger controls the consumable electrode, the inert gas flow, and the arc current. Unlike the electrode rod uh, used in stick welding, the MIG electrode is wire, and it's wound on a roll that is placed in the electrode wire feed unit. Wire up to one quarter inch in diameter can be fed from the unit into the electrode gun. The electrode wire is usually made of mild steel coated with copper to prevent rusting. Rusted wire causes poor feed action and poor quality welds, so wire on a roll exposed to the surrounding air should be used as quickly as possible. It's important that only wire made especially for a MIG gun be used for welding. Ordinary steel wire may not fit the gun properly, which could result in jamming or bending or other feed problems. The electrode wire is fed through the gun in two basic ways. On the push type gun, the speed of the wire feed is regulated by a control on the wire feed unit. While on the pull type gun, the feed rate is controlled by the gun drawing wire off the roll. During welding, the gas shield is supplied from the gas cylinder. A flexible hose carries the gas from the cylinder to the gun, where the rate of gas flow is controlled by the gun trigger. Argon, carbon dioxide, and helium are the inert gases usually used in MIG welding. The type of gas used is dependent upon the type metal to be welded. The welder's assistant generally has the job of maintaining the gas cylinders. Gas cylinders are often color-coded to indicate the kind of gas they contain. But in any case, they're always labeled. Your text has information on labels and color code identification used for gas cylinders, so uh, be sure to look it over. Before we go on to the TIG method of welding, I'd like to talk briefly about some of the advantages and disadvantages of the MIG method as compared to stick welding. First of all, MIG is a cleaner method than stick welding. This is because no slag deposits are formed during welding. And that, in turn, makes the MIG method faster. Now, you don't have to take the time to chip off the slag. MIG is also faster because the electrode wire is continuously fed through the gun. This eliminates the time it takes to change electrode rods. However, there are some disadvantages to the MIG method. The equipment is more complicated than that used for stick welding, so it takes longer to set up. And because the tip end of the welding gun is closer to the work, you may have trouble seeing into the weld area. Well, now let's talk about how the TIG, or tungsten inert gas method of welding, is different from the MIG and shielded gas processes of welding. Like the other two methods, TIG is a fusion process of welding. And a welding machine supplies the current through cables, just like in MIG and stick welding. A direct current machine can be used for TIG, but an alternate current machine is preferred for this method since High frequency alternating current is used to start the TIG arc. Now the TIG electrode holder is commonly called a torch. And here it is. The torch provides the heat needed to weld metals. To cool the torch, water or air is used. On a water-cooled torch, tubes carry water to circulating channels inside the torch. Water is generally used to cool torches of high amperage. Torches generating under 200 amps are normally cooled by air. 
Unlike the MIG and stick method of welding, the electrode used in the TIG process is non-consumable. It's made of pure tungsten or of tungsten alloys. Tungsten has a very high melting point and can withstand a high arc heat without melting or burning. The tungsten electrode serves as a conductor of electricity, carrying it from the torch through the arc to the metals to be welded. If filler metal is necessary to make a weld, a separate, uncoated filler rod is used. The inert gas supply used in the TIG method of welding is contained in cylinders similar to those used in the MIG method. The controls that regulate the amount of gas flow from the cylinder to the torch are located on a regulator attached to the cylinder. There is a flow indicator attached to the regulator. The TIG torch does not control gas flow like the pull type gun used in some MIG welding. It merely passes the gas through to the weld. As in the MIG method of welding, the gas acts to form a shield against air contamination during welding. Gases generally used in the TIG process are argon, helium, or a mixture of the two gases. Before beginning to weld, the valve on the regulator attached to the gas cylinder should be checked to allow no flow. Then the cylinder valve is opened and the regulator adjusted to the proper pressure. Finally, the flow is set for the desired rate of gas flow to the torch. One additional difference between TIG and the other welding methods is that current flow is controlled by a foot pedal starting and stopping the current. Now, let's see how two metal plates set perpendicular to each other are welded using the TIG method. First, the welder turns on the TIG rig. Then, as with stick welding, the grounding clamp is attached to the stand and the welder wears a shield and leather gloves. The foot pedal controls the flow of tungsten inert gas to the welding tool. And as the welder presses it, gas is fed through the hose and into the welding torch. There's no electrode. The tack weld is made with the torch, melting the metal, bonding the two plates. Each end of the metal plate is tack welded. Now, in this method of welding, a buildup of slag does not occur, so there's no need to grind off the tack welds. The welder is using a filler rod made of metal that is compatible with the metal of the two sheets. The filler rod will be consumed, but of course, the TIG tip will not. It's not always necessary to use a filler rod. Small welding jobs such as making tack welds can be accomplished using just the tip of the TIG torch. A ridge will be formed by the filler rod. If the filler rod were not compatible with the metal of the workpiece, the weld would not be of satisfactory strength. Here then is the finished weld. Although the TIG torch tip is not consumed by the welding process, it does wear down after a period of time, and then it must be changed. To change the tip, the ceramic shield is removed first. Then the nut is loosened and the worn tip taken out. The new tip is put in place and then checked against the length of the ceramic shield to be sure it extends out far enough. Then the nut is tightened and the ceramic shield is pressed back onto the torch. The TIG method of welding has several advantages over other methods of welding. As you saw, it produces a highly concentrated and intense heat source. This makes the TIG welding process very fast because the weld is formed almost instantly. There are no slag deposits in this process, and the welds are usually clean and require very little smoothing. Since the tungsten electrode is non-consumable, time need not be spent to replace a used up electrode. However, a potential problem 
with the tungsten electrode is contamination. The electrode can become contaminated if it comes into contact with the base metals that are being welded. And if a filler rod is used, the electrode must not touch it. The tip of the electrode can be ruined by contact with any other surface during welding. In addition, the area accidentally touched by an electrode will be burned and turn black. So as you can see, there are certain advantages and disadvantages to each of the welding processes we've talked about. The method the welder uses is generally determined by the type of welding to be done. We've also seen that there are many similarities as well as certain differences between the stick, MIG, and TIG welding processes. The stick and MIG methods use consumable electrodes, while the TIG method uses a non-consumable tungsten electrode. The MIG and TIG methods use inert gas to form a shield against air contaminations, but the stick method produces a slag deposit that protects against nitrogen and oxygen in the surrounding air. I'll take time now to go over the MIG and TIG processes in your text. Be sure you understand the differences in the equipment used and how each process works. Later, we'll talk about some of the special safety precautions taken by welders in their work, some of the special types of welds that can be made, and other kinds of equipment that is used in welding. The three welding processes that we've talked about so far, stick welding, MIG, and TIG, are certainly the most common you'll see used in the plant, but there are many different types of welding methods, some of which are used for specific purposes. Let's look briefly at two other welding processes, resistance welding and plasma arc welding. We'll begin with resistance welding. Basically, there are three kinds of resistance welding, seam welding, spot welding, and projection welding. The name spot welding describes the action. The process is used to fuse sheets of metal in spots rather than all along a surface. Resistance welding does not produce a weld through an arc like the processes we've discussed thus far. Pressure must be applied from two pointed electrodes on opposite sides of the surface to be welded. Electric current passes through one electrode, then the metal being welded, and then through the opposite electrode. The resistance to current flow of the metal plates causes heat to be generated, melting or fusing the two pieces together. The surfaces to be welded and the electrode tips must be cleaned thoroughly before the weld can be made. This ensures proper current flow and a good weld. Resistance seam welding is used when the job requires that a full surface or seam be welded. The process is similar to spot welding except that the electrodes are not pointed. They're disc shaped. They roll along the surface to be welded. Pressure through the electrodes presses the metal sheets together at the same time that electric current melts and fuses the weld. The third basic resistance process is projection welding. This method is used when one of the metal sheets has a preformed bump. Now the projection weld melts the bump into the surface of the other metal sheet, and this way produces the weld. Plasma arc welding is similar to the TIG process we talked about earlier. Plasma is a collection of charged particles which will conduct electricity. Like the TIG method, the plasma arc method uses a torch for welding, but the plasma torch is made with two gas channels, one for the shielding gas, which is like the one on the TIG torch, and another one that feeds an ionizing gas heated by the tungsten tip, forming the gas into a plasma gas. This is called the plasma jet. The result is a greater concentration of heat, which results in a faster weld. When a filler metal is required, it can be applied in three ways. A filler rod can be held by the welder, 
or filler metal can be fed in automatically from a roll or spool. A third method of applying filler for the weld is to place consumable metal filler into the joint before the welding is begun. In any case, the metal must be compatible with the metal of the surfaces to be welded. Well, in all of the welding processes we've talked about, stick welding, MIG, TIG, resistance welding, and just now plasma arc welding, we can see that the type of electrode used is a crucial factor in producing the proper weld. The amount of current that flows through the electrode, the kind of gas used, and the type of metal being welded, all of these things are important considerations in the type of electrode chosen for each of the welding processes. The welder and the welder's assistant must be sure that the right type of electrode is at hand before the welding uh, begins. Now this can be done by understanding the identifying code system that has been designed to classify the different types of electrodes used in welding. An identification code was set up by the National Electrical Manufacturers Association and later revised by the American Welding Society, or AWS. All welding rods should be identified by the AWS electrode designation code. Code numbers are generally printed on the rod, but for very thin rods, there is a color code system. Now, here's the way the AWS code works. The first letter of the code gives the rod usage. For example, the letter E indicates that the rod is intended for electric arc welding. The letter R indicates that it is a filler rod. The letter B means that the rod should be used for brazing. Now the next two numbers give the minimum strength of a weld produced using the rod. So a rod with a code that reads E702 means that it should be used for electric arc welding with a minimum strength requirement of 70,000 PSI. Now that third number indicates the position the rod should be held in during welding. The number one means that it may be held in any position, while a two indicates that it may be held horizontally or flat against the weld surface. And a number three means that the rod must be held flat against the weld surface. The last number of the code gives the type of power supply that should be used with the rod. This reading is based on the diameter of the electrode rod. A suffix at the end of the AWS number code will indicate if a special alloy is contained in the rod. You find more information on electrode rod identification in your text, so be sure to look it over. Well, as, uh, as we've watched the welder at work, we've seen that he's always careful about wearing adequate safety gear. And it's easy to understand why. A, a welder or a welder's assistant could be badly burned without protective clothing. Let's have a closer look at the special gear that's necessary for your personal safety during welding and at some of the other precautions you should take to ensure the safety of other plant personnel when you are setting up equipment for a welding job. Two conditions that are always present in any welding process are intense light and heat. The welder and the welder's assistant must ensure that they are adequately protected from these conditions. A welder is required to wear three things, a helmet with dark lens, goggles, and fire-resistant gauntlet gloves. The welding helmet covers the entire face and the top and sides of the head. It shields the welder from flying sparks and bits of metal. The dark lenses of the helmet and goggles protect the welder's eyes from the bright light and the harmful rays which are emitted from the arc during welding. Protective lenses are available in a variety of shades, from light to dark, depending upon the intensity of the light produced by the welding process. Fire-resistant gauntlet gloves are usually made of leather and protect against burns when sparks fly during welding. They should fit well so that the electrode holder can be held firmly and with control. Now, certain types of clothing are considered safest to wear during welding. A long sleeve shirt button to the neck should always be worn to protect against flying sparks and bits of metal. 
cuffs on pants and patch pockets on pants or shirts can catch and hold flying hot materials and should not be worn during welding. High top leather shoes that fit up under the cuffless pants and a hat under the helmet are added protection against burns. Now there are some welding jobs such as welding overhead that are particularly hazardous in regard to flying sparks and molten metal. In these cases, flame resistant jackets, leggings and aprons are available and should be worn. In addition to the protective clothing worn by the welder and the welder's assistant, there are safety measures that should be taken to protect other plant personnel during a welding job. All permanent welding areas should be fitted with flame resistant curtains. Portable screens can be used at temporary welding locations. These measures will protect other plant personnel from the hazards of intense light and flying sparks and molten metal particles. Proper ventilation is another important factor. When metals are melted, hazardous fumes may be given off. The effects depend upon the amount inhaled. With proper ventilation, the amount inhaled can be reduced or eliminated. At permanent welding locations, the ventilation should be installed to exhaust the fumes to an external or outside location away from you and the other plant personnel. On job sites where there is no permanent ventilation, portable ventilation equipment should be used. When the welder is at work, signs should be posted in the area to warn others of possible hazards produced during the process. Well, that concludes our unit on the basics of arc welding. We've seen how the equipment is set up and the kinds of preparations that need to be made before the welding job is started. Then we talked about the three most common methods of welding you find in practice at the plant. Stick welding, metal inert gas, and tungsten inert gas welding, or uh, MIG and TIG. And later we looked at two not so common processes, resistance welding and plasma arc welding. We compared all of these processes and we discussed the ways that electrodes are classified and identified. And finally, we talked about the kinds of protective clothing you wear and about the precautions you can take to ensure the safety of others in the welding area. Now, go over the material in your text to be sure that you have a good understanding of the basic welding processes. You find it'll be useful information as you begin your job as a welder's assistant.